is James Backstrom, MD. He is the current Chief Medical Officer for Foundation Radiology Group. He holds a BS in Biology from Westminster College and a medical degree from the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Backstrom completed an internal medicine internship at Bethesda Naval Hospital. He served four years as General Medical Officer at the Marines Quantico Marine Base, heading up the Officer Candidate School Training Program and as the Chief Medical Officer at the Marine Corps Basic Training School, or the Basic School. He was awarded the Naval Achievement Medal and the Naval Commendation Medal for various accomplishments during his service in the United States Navy. Following completion of his military obligations, Dr. Backstrom completed a diagnostic radiology residency and six months fellowship in adult neuroradiology at Duke University. Dr. Backstrom specializes in neuroradiology and pediatric neuroradiology. Neuro his pediatric training, Dr. Backstrom completed a pediatric radiology fellowship at the Children's Hospital in Buffalo, New York. He also completed a pediatric neuroradiology fellowship at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Please welcome Dr. Backstrom. Appreciate very much uh, the introduction, Dave, and uh, welcome to everybody uh, for a very important lecture and, and hopefully one that you'll find both informative and entertaining. Uh, I certainly want to make sure that by the end of the lecture today that everyone has a pretty good understanding of what ALARA is and the importance of ALARA and the importance of ALARA not only in the pediatric segment of the population but the growing importance of ALARA in almost anything that involves uh, radiation and radiation therapy. So this is uh, designed to be a primer. It's designed by, to basically assume that uh, we're beginning at square zero and, and that we're going to try to develop a, an understanding of ALARA and uh, certainly we'll be willing to, to take any questions and the questions we don't get to today. Uh, Dave will have my contact information. I certainly would like to engage with anybody. This is a, a very important topic for radiology and one that I think you're going to find, uh, you know, find important to your practice as well and hopefully we'll give you some, some pointers on how to, to get uh, deeply involved in the whole ALARA regulation program. So for those um, who don't know, ALARA means as low as reasonably achievable, and our goal is to get radiation doses down to uh, as low as possible levels, but still, of course, enjoy the benefits of imaging. So in our ALARA lecture, we're going to talk about Edsel's, right? Well, not really. The truth of the matter is we're in a changing environment at this point in time, and uh, a lot of us and a lot of radiologists would like to go back to the good old days, and the good old days of when you could push a button and get any kind of x-ray that you wanted to and not really worry about this. Uh, I first encountered an Edsel in about 1964, so I'm clearly going to date myself. I drove in it. It was a very memorable experience. This is a big car, weighed 3,500 pounds, had lots of chrome on it bright sunny day driving an Edsel, and the truth is I'd like to try to find an Edsel, but uh, they were only made for, for three years and, and, and Edsels are simply gone and uh, will never come back. The same is true with people like this guy. If you don't know this guy, this guy back in, in, the, in the 70s and 80s was known as Cat Stevens. He took sort of a turn to the left or maybe the right or maybe up or down, I don't know, but he's no longer Cat Stevens and ends up being something else. And I will tell you that I hearken back and would like to sort of remember Cat Stevens as Cat Stevens, but again, this, uh, this guy as Cat Stevens is simply gone. And then, of course, we, we all know what happened in New York in September, and um, in September 1st, uh, or September 11th in, uh, in 2001. This picture was actually taken um, uh, right, around, uh, right around the end of October. I took this picture and was quite dissatisfied with it because it was such a a cloudy day and a bad day, and I thought, oh, what a horrible picture. And uh, only later, of course, did the picture capture a bit more meaning, and, uh, and of course, this site is not, uh, is not uh, visible anymore. And uh, luckily, we're moving towards a, a brand new tower and, and, and one that is spectacular and honors those who, who were killed in 9-11. In, in, in but uh, again, we can't go back and replace the towers. The, those days are simply gone. And for radiology and for the purposes of ALARA, this is actually the paper that kind of began to really cause us to think of things in a different way. It was, um, it was published uh, by Brenner and Elliston and AJR, and um, as after it was published, uh, they came up with some pretty reasonable conclusions. And, and, and not anything earth shattering, quite frankly, but just want to go through what the conclusions of that paper were. The best available risk estimates suggest that pediatric CT will result in significantly increased lifetime radiation risks over adult CT. 
both because of increased dose per milliamp second and because of increased lifetime risk per dose. Although the risk-benefit balance is still strongly tilted toward benefits, the estimate that quantitative lifetime radi radiation risk for children undergoing CT are not negligible and may stimulate more active reduction of CT exposure settings for pediatric patients. And essentially what this paper said is, hey, I think we've, we've discovered a problem. It's not a, a huge problem, but it's one that is statistically significant. And maybe we ought to think about how we image children and see if we can't get radiation doses to, to a lower level. And that was a very reasonable suggestion based on the data that they presented in that paper. And everything was fine in the, in the medical community until this hit. And on January 22, 2001, uh, there was sort of a, a nuclear explosion based on a USA Today article that basically went to an awful lot of people who didn't have a lot of understanding about radiation, and people began to ask a lot of essentially nuclear-style questions and radiation questions to practitioners, and it opened up the radiology community to a, a lot of scrutiny, and some of, it was, uh, some of it was difficult to handle because some of the questions that were asked we just simply didn't have answers to, but it certainly uh, uh, caused a, a disturbance and a, a relatively poisonous environment uh, <clears throat> during the period of time that, that this uh, article came out. And really, should have we been su surprised? Um, we've really known about radiation issues for many, many years. This is our friend uh, Rankin, who basically discovered some kind of magical ray that was able to penetrate uh, human tissue. And he called this X-rays, which is where we get our X-ray name from. And uh, this was done in, in 1895, and he won the Nobel Prize, in fact, the first Nobel Prize for physics uh, sometimes later. But the, the, the picture that you see to the right over here is actually a picture of his, of his wife. And uh, he actually liked to image his wife, and actually his wife liked to image herself. And um, just showing again how little was known at that period of time about exactly what could happen with exposure to radiation. Dr. Casbian was a, a, a physician in Philadelphia. He was actually a neurosurgeon, but he got caught up in this whole fervor of what could be done with radiation therapy. And he was a very, 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 very curious man. And this is actually a picture of Dr. Casbian in 1901, as you can see, without any glasses, he's using what is called a fluoroscope, and uh, uh, centered above him uh, over the wall are a lot of different pictures that he's taken of, of, of snakes, of, uh, of what he thought were tuberculosis, uh, um, calculi, and he really was quite interested in this, and people estimate that over a period of time, he actually performed as many as 3,000 uh, radiology studies. and. Uh, gave us sort of the uh, first documented case of radiation dermatitis, which is uh, certainly uh, concerning given his, uh, his affiliation with radiation. But more concerning was the fact that although this guy did begin as a neurosurgeon, uh, over time his ability to do neurosurgery clearly became somewhat limited. This is sort of a fingers going, going, gone exercise, and likely along with his fingers going were any kind of a fruitful neurosurgical career. But he died from radiation exposure in 1911 and was very meticulous about documenting the effects and is one of the first reported documented effects of, of significant uh, radiation injury. And he did die from a radiation-induced cancer. Then there's Clarence Daly. Clarence Daly, perhaps one of the more documented uh, uh, radiation uh, survivor, well, radiation um, uh, casualties. Uh, radi uh, he was a, a glass blower, as it turned out, for Thomas Edison, and um, he decided uh, he wanted to get into something different. And Thomas Edison, at that time, was uh, doing one of his uh, typical experiments, and he was he was experimenting with a, with a fluoroscope that was actually much better than that which uh, Rankin had discovered. It was a, a much produced a much sharper picture, and uh, actually Clarence Daly and his brother got very involved in, in looking at this fluoroscope. And this is a picture of the fluoroscope, and you can see that, again, much the same experimentation. They looked at feet, they looked at hands, and uh, over a period of time, our friend uh, Mr. Daly basically uh, developed cancer, and uh, he, uh, he died in the year 1904, and uh, Thomas Edison basically uh, uh, made this statement once, I will not say I failed a thousand times, I will say that I discovered there are a thousand ways that can cause failure. This, of course, didn't help Mr. Daly any, and um, 
uh, Mr. Edison, as a, as, a, as a matter of fact, basically said that he never wanted to be associated with x-rays again because he was just completely afraid of them and uh, for good reason, obviously. Sorry about that. It is not like all this happened in the 1800s because radiation problems have been going on for some time. These are very high dose radiation. This is just a potpourri of pictures that kind of show a lot of things that you probably have heard about in the news. Um, uh, the Russian patient who basically was poisoned by, the, by his government, Chernobyl, uh, Madame Curie, nuclear submarines that had radiation accidents. And then uh, on the right hand corner, these are just pictures of basically the Manhattan Project and something referred to as the Dragon's Tail, which actually killed a few, few people and was re re a result of massive radiation exposure. Not to mention really, of course, the, the, the most classic and the, and the one we've probably gained the most information from, which is Hiroshima. Before I go any further, I just want to just point out that I'm obviously a pediatric radiologist and quite proud of my profession, but pediatrics, uh, the pediatric community in radiology, and particularly this journal, Pediatric Radiology, has been very, very um, uh, important in trying to bring to bear some information for everybody concerning ALARA and radiation exposure. I've listed here, just for your reference, a number of issues of pediatric radiology over the last few years, starting with a white paper in 2001 and extending up to a, a very recent update in September 2011. And a lot of this lecture is, is, uh, is really gleaned from some of the information in these articles. These people are very dedicated, and I, I think that every, uh, everybody who's interested in the LARA probably should have access to these articles and uh, a very, very good uh, use of, of journal time to bring this to the public's attention. So I put this up because here we go through some graphs. It's hard to go through LAR without some graphs. So what I did is I, I congregated them all in one place so that uh, you can take a deep breath with me. We'll try to get through some of these graphs together. And uh, I promise that we'll, uh, we'll go through them quickly and there'll be a, a very little pain. Just a few notes about radiation conversion. Um, in the literature, as you read, there's a lot of confusion because a lot of people begin to use terms uh, one to the other. I just put this in again as, as, a, as a reference source for when you're reading articles, but essentially sieverts and REMS are terms of radiation protection absorbed dose equivalents. Grays and RADs are units of absorbed dose. And we're more and more tending towards this BERT phenomena, which is to evaluate radiation exposure based on how it looks compared to the background radiation. Which is, which is very useful. That is, you know, a, ch a chest x-ray is, is like having 2.3 days of background radiation. And that gives people, I think, some perspective and allows one to compare one radiology study to the next. In the old days, when we looked at radiation problems and exposure problems to radiation, um, we, we used A-bomb survivors, and we had very limited data for what occurred in the very small range. This graph essentially shows what our knowledge was um, probably through the 1950s and 60s, and that is that there is an increased risk of cancer with uh, atomic bomb survivors, but down here where conventional radiology exists, that small dose, no one quite knew exactly what to do with that small dose and whether or not there was indeed any risk at all. And in fact, there were many ways that people used to extrapolate downward to say whether or not there was a risk for small doses of radiation. And the most popular was probably the threshold dose, which said that there wasn't a risk with small dose radiation, and actually you had to have a radiation threshold before the risks began to kick in. And then there were other people that believed it was just a straight linear evaluation. That all changed as time went on because we got to watch these A-bomb survivors over time and we could then very uh, accurately or more accurately extrapolate backwards to find out whether there was a risk uh, for dose ranges in pediatric CT. And this is the basis of this article in 2002 by Hall, which basically shows that, in fact, the dose range that we utilize for pediatric CT does have, in fact, albeit very, very small risk, it does have measurable risks uh, to patients 
over the course of the patient's lifetime, and therefore we need to be very careful and think closely and carefully about whether or not we need to expose a child to a radiation uh, dose for a CT scan or, for that matter, for an X-ray. Now, with enhanced follow-up and time, we're able to tease away even other facts, and that is that females, as it turns out, are somewhat more susceptible to males, and clear to the risk is um, greatly elevated the younger the patient is. And you can see that at the age of exposure, the risk becomes quite small as we get outwards. The patient doesn't have as long to live, but if, it's, if the exposure occurs at a very early stage in life, and particularly if there's uh, exposure to a female, there is, uh, there is some measurable increased risk for radiation exposure. And so let's shift gears just a little bit. Um, uh, it's at the same time we began to understand the effects of low-dose radiation, we began to do extensive radiographic exams that were just not simply plain films. In fact, this is about the time that the age of CT begins. And with it comes a much larger dose range on a per-study basis, and this provides more radiation to adults. And, and I think this graph is a very good way to kind of look at this because you can see the relative increase in radiation dose on a per-study basis between a chest X-ray, which, again, has essentially a, a, um, a value of 8, to a CT scan in some cases, which are as, as high as uh, 610 milligrams. And uh, so basically, the amount of radiation that we're exposing on a per-study basis basically increases dramatically uh, during the period of time where, where CT use escalated dramatically. And with that, really the most important thing is not necessarily the overall exposure, but it's the organ dose exposure. And this is some uh, adult uh, data that comes up. And, and basically you can see that the things uh, that are the most important, that is thyroid, breast, lungs, ovaries, and testes, that is the most active tissue, and in fact bone marrow for a potential leukemia, do in fact have much higher uh, doses. In fact, again, we go to chest x-rays for active bone marrow being uh, something like 2 uh, millirads, and uh, organ doses up to 13,000 millirads can occur with helical CT scan. So again, uh, the advent of the CT scan, the advent of the escalation of the use of CT scans clearly puts the population and, in fact, individual patients in a much different range with respect to their exposure and to their vital organ exposure uh, to radiation therapy and to radiation um, uh, for imaging purposes. Again, another graph to just emphasize that uh, we do see CT as a high-dose procedure. A chest X-ray has an equivalent background radiation time, again, this BERT uh, phenomenon I told you about, um, of 2.4 days. So if you're exposed to a chest X-ray, it's like living for two extra days in background radiation, if you will. But look what happens to an abdominal CT. The equivalent background radiation time for an abdominal CT is as much as 3.3 years uh, back in 2002. Hopefully we've decreased that significantly with some of our ALARA initiatives. Luckily, CT's incidence seems to be increasing with age, that is, we don't do as many CTs on adults, but the truth of the matter is the number of CTs we've done has increased across the whole population, including children, uh, since 1995 and since, uh, particularly up to the year of approximately 2005-2006. In the pediatric population specifically, we're actually seeing a phenomenon where CTs are begin, beginning to level off and, in fact, are beginning to fall sometime. We think that, again, in the pediatric population, this is a direct result of what has gone on since the 2000 white paper about ALARA up to now, where there has been extensive initiation of, uh, of, of things inside the pediatric community to try to educate uh, referring clinicians and the public and even radiologists about ways to decrease radiation exposure, and we're going to go through some of those uh, in this lecture. This is more evidence that CT affects the very young in a very profound way, and the shape of the curve shows that the females are more affected than males, especially when it comes to things like abdominal CT exposure. And you can see here's a male graph for abdominal CT, which is somewhat more linear than this somewhat bump occurs, showing that the female abdominal CT and the female patient, again, does have slightly increased risk over their male counterparts, uh, even for um, one single CT scan. And this is the last uh, graph that we're going to have to suffer through here. And, and again, it's, it's important to note, I've been asked many times, well, okay, look, 
um, I've only had one CT in my life, does that mean anything, or I'm only going to have one CT, does that mean anything? And the truth of the matter is, a single CT as a function of age, um, you can see that there is extraordinarily low, but there is some measurable risk even to a, C a single CT scan, and some people would say even to an x-ray or two as well. Again, um, these risks, are, are they have to be put in the perspective of the examination, um, and, and certainly most people think that uh, the, um, uh, the, the benefits of CT far outweigh the risks in many cases, but just to kind of summarize what we've done with the graphs, uh, an increased understanding of low-dose radiation effects have, have now occurred after years of study, and we know pretty much now that even low levels of radiation do carry, albeit low, they do carry some risk. Younger patients are more at risk than older patients, in part due to more time to live with the consequences of the exposure. Females, on the whole, are more at risk than males, but both have some effect, and even a single CT carries some risk, albeit very small. Whenever you look at a CT today and you want, want to know whether or not there is a dose, and this is probably a very ignored number on CT scans in my experience talking to both radiologists. It is no longer ignored in California because in California this has to be reported. I think that's going to be the trend across the country. Um, and certainly I want you to at least know these two uh, numbers and how they're calculated and what some of their foibles are. So just bear with me with this for a second. Uh, CTDI volume equals two-thirds of the time the surface dose plus one-third uh, times the central dose divided by pitch developed with a phantom. But this is very important. The value will depend on which phantom is used. And we don't have standardized phantoms. So in order for you to compare across machines or between sites, it's very important that you conference with your physicist to be sure you understand which phantom you use. Do you use a 10 centimeter, 16 centimeter, or 32 centimeter phantom? Because that will very much affect uh, exactly what numbers you get for your uh, CTDI volume. Um, Again, this is not a patient-absorbed dose, and that's a very important point. The DLP is, is the other thing that you're going to see on the, uh, on, on the classic film. And, and again, this is, uh, this is just the CTDI volume times the scan length. So it represents, or it attempts to represent, some component of energy transferred. Um, this value also is phantom dependent, and therefore, again, in comparing across uh, scanners and across institutions, uh, you have to know what scanners are used. Um, and uh, again, this is not a patient-absorbed dose. If we had our druthers, if we could accurately measure it, we would like to have patient-absorbed dose and not just radiation dispensed. A couple comments. 16-centimeter phantom overestimates the adult dose and underestimates the pediatric dose. A 32-centimeter phantom under underestimates the pediatric dose and the adult dose by a factor of about 2.5. There's clearly a lot of work, and, and this September issue that I told you about pediatrics went through in a very, very elegant fashion with some great lectures about ways that people are looking towards making more accurate methodologies to me measure dose. This will be coming down the pike in a few years, uh, and really what the ultimate is is to try to figure out ways to accurately measure and predict organ dose but this is some time, time away. And just to mention a couple of things, the TG204 uh, initiative is a, a way to try to look at correction factors that attempt to moderate for patient size. Um, it may be that we're going to have to go back and, and use calipers to measure patients to get accurate measurements of, uh, of, of, of tissue um, uh, absorption. Uh, there's also some Monte Carlo method, methodology, which quite frankly is way beyond my, uh, my thought process. This is a, a modeling and a mathematical modeling that is put together again to try to more accurately measure radiation dose. So how in the heck did we get into this alarm conundrum anyways? Just a couple of background pieces of data. In 1980, in this country, we did about 3 million CT scans. In, in the year 2005, we did 68 million. That, that is a revolution. That is an unbelievable number of scans, an unbelievable amount of radiation that the population has, uh, has, um, has, in, has had in addition to what they normally had. And, and really, why was that? Well, it was because in many ways, um, we put the picture of the surgeon on the uh, on the tombstone. Well, the, the truth of the matter is, uh, many times that we would do exploratory surgeries, we've been able to not do exploratory surgeries or make an accurate diagnosis without actually having to cut the patient. And the truth of the matter is, CT scans have served an extraordinarily uh, useful purpose. Um, patients and parents understand CTs. Um, they ask for them. In fact, 
in many cases demand them. We all know the climate that all of us live in is a very litigious climate, and uh, uh, I certainly have uh, been on stand as an expert witness and, and have heard people ask this question to someone who is, is, is undergoing uh, examination, and that is, doctor, why didn't you get a CT scan? And if you would answer, well, I was worried about the radiation dose or I was worried about the cost, they would basically cut your head off, and, and obviously this is something that all of us worry about. Um, there's also this demand for everything to be immediate. In the old days, if a person thought, was thought to have appendicitis, they'd be placed in an exam room for a couple hours to see if the disease progressed or went away. If it progressed, it may be more likely appendicitis, but now what they want is we, they want a disposition immediately and they want it within a 30-minute TAT time. There's clearly a price to pay for those, uh, those demands. And then, truthfully, there's a lack of proper radiation training across all spheres. There are states in this country that, that require only a handful of hours for someone to actually work a CT scan. Then there are other states that, that have a very, you know, a very uh, good bent from the standpoint of how they, they demand training for people. But there's, there's still a lot of radiation uh, being dispensed to the population by people who are, uh, who are poorly trained and certainly not very well versed in the whole uh, subject of Alara. And then there's just the, the matter of convenience as well. This is an interesting study that I, or an interesting set of pictures that I like, and, and really it raises the question of how much is too much? I first, uh, I have a picture that's very much like the 1974 study that I got from a, uh, the Dent Clinic in New York. Uh, the head of that clinic went to hear a lecture by the EMI people in uh, New York, was so enthralled by this picture that he saw very much like this in 1974, that he immediately bought an airplane ticket, flew to London, and basically on the spot bought uh, one of these CT scanners for his clinic back in Buffalo. And you would say, well, gosh, that picture is horrible. Why would someone pay a million bucks for that picture? Well, the truth of the matter is that at that period of time, all that we could do to diagnose things like hydrocephalus were to basically do invasive procedures, some of which carried um, risk uh, rates of, of even mortality rates of 1%. And so therefore, when he saw this picture, he thought, gosh, I will never have to worry about whether or not I can diagnose just hydrocephalus again, let alone uh, large brain tumors, and, and therefore prevent the patient from having to go through things like angiography. And over time, you can see we've, we've improved uh, the resolution and the ability to look at the brain but the question is, how much is too much? And, and, and that's really, I think, a, a question that's going to come up in your mind as you hear this lecture more and more. Do we really need to have this much detail and that much radiation exposure if we can get this level of detail and make the diagnosis of hydrocephalus? And that's really a mindset difference that all of us, I think, have to really begin to put our hands around because we have to now think about how much radiation exposure we're giving and do we need to have every picture that we make be something that is worthy of a textbook. So again, how much is too much and how much is too little? And really the rest of this lecture is going to be kind of centered around trying to answer these questions. So in a sense, this goes back to my pediatric bent, so I'm sorry, this is how I think, but uh, in, in, we're kind of in search of radiation Goldilocks here. Um, we don't want the porridge too hot, we don't want the porridge too cold, we don't want the chair too small, we don't want the chair too big. What we would like to try to find is that equation that gives us the information we need, but at the lowest possible radiation dose, and in a sense, that is the entire subject of this lecture. We want to get it just right, and we want to look and search for radiation Goldilocks, not only when dealing with our pediatric patients, but hopefully also as we turn to our adult patients. So what is a radiologist to do? What is a department manager to do? Um, I will tell you that as you go around and you talk to clinicians, many people think that when you do a CT scan, you basically push a button and give me the doggone film. And as we all know, who, uh, for, the, for those of us who do this, it's not quite that simple. And if we just go through factors that affect the CT dose and the dose distribution, and under the scan parameters, we have things like geometry, rotation angle, collimation, filtration, focal spot size. Under things that the operator, operator can actually control, we have things like KVP, MA, scan time, field of view, the pitch of the scanner, slice thickness, spacing, scan volume. All of these things are things that we can actively pursue and actively change to perhaps modify both the way the scan looks and for the purpose of this lecture, the amount of radiation dose that a person uh, will have based on the scan. So I'm going to go through just a few of these. 
These are the ones that perhaps have the most bang for your buck, if you will. I would hope that by the end of this, um, uh, this, this segment of the, of the lecture that you at least have some understanding of things that you can do inside your machine and certainly dealing with your vendor with respect to these and making sure that your machinery is optimized in, in the whole world of Alara is something that your vendor and every vendor in the country right now is very, very focused on because uh, radiologists and particularly pediatric radiologists have led the, 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 uh, the charge of making sure that everyone is focused on this. So let's just go through some of these pitch, dose, scan thickness, et cetera, and see if we can't just gear down and, and drill down on some of the, the, the more uh, relevant points. First of all, many machines default to a pitch of one. And this is really simple. You know, the faster the body moves through the scanner, the less any individual organ or any individual segment of that body will be exposed to a radiation beam. So we should use the fastest pitch and the thickest slice thick thickness that will answer the question that we want to know. And again, that's very dependent on the clinical history. Very important to have the clinical history whenever you're designing the CT scan. Very important for the radiologist to be involved in the design of these protocols. And often pitches of 1.5 and 2 are often quite adequate to answer the question that we need to answer. And when you put a pitch of 1 or 1.5 or 1 and 2 side by side, it's very difficult often to tell the difference. And really you have to ask yourself, do you really need that extra high quality scan, that beautiful scan that you could put into a, chest, into a, uh, into a textbook to answer the question? And the, and, the, and the answer is you don't. And the answer is you should use the lowest possible radiation dose that will answer the question. The length of coverage and the number of slices. This is a very important one. Don't make abdomen and pelvis as automatic. If you can answer the question it needs to be answered with just an abdomen or with just a pelvis, it, you should try to do that. Um, image as much as possible. Only those segments of the anatomy that will answer the question asked. Um, this may, I think beneficially, uh, have a, the benefit of actually uh, making sure that we have extensive opportunities for interaction. Communication might exist between clinical physicians and radiologists. And in the days of PACs where that happens less often, this is some place where I think every department can really try to motivate their radiologists and their clinical staff to be sure that these opportunities for interaction happen because in that interaction we can actually modify our scans to be sure that we're, we're doing the scan with the lowest possible radiation dose, therefore uh, the best possible benefit for the patient. One of the things I see all the time is that people include half the chest in an abdomen and pelvis CT scan up to the, uh, uh, up to the hilum, and, and certainly uh, if there's a reason to do that clinically, uh, that's fine, but if there is not, it's just unnecessary radiation exposure for the purposes of that examination. And, and the other question is these protocols that just automatically go to both non-contrast and contrasted exams, really we need to take a look at those, and do you really need both, or can the question be asked with one? And you know, quite honestly, just with that methodology alone, you can uh, often half the CT scan dose for that. Um, and really, the dosage differences can be very, very dramatic between high dose and low dose scans. Now, high dose scans with uh, millisie 4.5 millisieverts with 140 MAS, 140 kVp, and a pitch of one. We take the pitch down to two and lower the MA, and all of a sudden we're looking at a, a significant reduction in dose to 0.7 millisieverts. So these type of thought processes can really, really uh, improve things. And certainly the, the thing that has been the most uh, on the forefront of decreasing dose has been the modification and the thought process that revolves around how much MAS we're going to uh, give to a patient as they do a CT scan. And this should be something at the very forefront of every CT technologist and CT physician's mind as they do scanners. MAS control can really decrease the amount of radiation, and you combine that with modifications in pitch, and you can really have a dramatic effect on the, uh, on the exposure rates. So what does this all look like? This comes from a friend of mine, Don Frush. Uh, uh, basically, uh, to the left is a, an 80 MA examination, and to the right is a 40 MA examination. And if you look really close, you can see that the one on the right is not quite as sharp. It's not quite as defined, but I will tell you that the one on the right is every bit as diagnostic as the one on the left with a significant reduction in dose, and that essentially is what we're looking for in an Alara uh, type of setting. I had mentioned pitch. The uh, exam on your left is a pitch of one. This also comes from Don Frush. And the exam on the right is a pitch of two. And, and again, I, I would tell you that although there's different phases in the contrast injection here, um, really the, the resolution 
perhaps slightly lower. One of the benefits you get sometimes from increasing the pitch is you get a little bit little less motion artifact, but again, there's, there's a, it's a trade-off, but it does result in a significant decrease uh, in dose, and if, 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 if one can get away with it, it's clearly a good way to try to uh, decrease the dosage in a relatively uh, easy fashion. So we've gone through uh, pitch and dose, particularly MA. Um, should mention that there's a lot of movement now to look at KV and how we can decrease the amount of KV exposure. Uh, the uh, effect is not as dramatic, but there still are some benefits in doing lower KV scans. Um, I'm going to go through the last uh, few here, bow tie filters, patient positioning, uh, indication-based um, imaging, friendly environments, and single phase, phase imaging. So bow tie filters really have come to bear on most modern CT scans now. They diminish soft radiation, or essentially they diminish that part of the radiation dose that uh, is often absorbed but does not really provide any useful um, imaging production, and, and therefore a very, very good way to decrease dose is to get rid of the stuff that you don't really need or that you don't really use. Um, these bow tie filters are built into the machine and have their effect prior to the radiation reaching the patient, so they're not shielded on the patient but actually built into the machinery of the radiation production. They essentially concentrate the radiation appropriately to the thickest part of the body. And if you just think of this very simply, the thickest part of the body tends to be the middle in a bow tie. The bow tie filter is the thinnest in the middle, the broadest on the periphery. So it decreases those soft radiations to the periphery, but it intensifies or allows more intense radiation to go to those part of the bodies that are thickest and therefore need to be uh, imaged with a bit, a bit more oomph to the radiation beam. And as it turns out, there's been studies to show that bow tie filters quite significantly reduce the the surface do dose by as much as 50%. So again, utilizing a very old CT scanners that do not have the, the more uh, advanced uh, filtration systems does have some risk to the patient. This is something that I think really does not get paid attention to as much in radio radiology departments. The excuses I have for by technologists, well, you know, it takes time to do this and the patient's often moving. But the truth of the matter is CT scans were designed to be optimized when the patient sits in the mid of the, of the uh, CT scanner. Not off to the side, not bent, but in the middle of the CT scanner. There are many, many advantages to this. It decreases the artifacts. It enhances the functionality of the inbred bow tie filter that we just talked about. It increases the distance from the radiation source, thus that also decreases the dose. As you know, decre increasing distance has a dramatic effect on decreasing dose, and it allows something built into the system called an automatic exposure control to work more efficiently because it was designed to be able to, to function with the patient in the center of the scan. And it's very important that the automatic exposure controls that are built into the many modern scanners clearly have allowed us to do a lot of dose modulation while choosing essentially the noise level that we want, but if not utilized correctly, can actually enhance the noise. So it's something that we ought to be paying attention to, and putting the patient in the center of the scanner is a very, very important endeavor. The truth of the matter is one size does not fit all here. One push of the button does not equal a CT scan. Again, all of us who do CT scans understand that, but there are clearly some areas of imaging that are very noise tolerant and thus can be done at very, very low MA levels. Um, people that have had chest done to, e to evaluate for pectus excavatum deformities prior to surgery, for instance, can have a very, very low MA, 20, 40 MA, and still have a successful scan that gives the surgeon every bit of knowledge he needs and therefore saving the patient extensive dose uh, problems with uh, a regular chest CT scan. Parts of skeletal imaging, there was just a recent article that came out uh, in, in, in AGR that discusses how low one can go just for routine lung imaging and nodule follow-up, and as low as 20 MA and 40 MA were, were, uh, were looked at, and, and actually you can get very successful imaging um, when, when doing follow-up examination. So again, each individual CT being tailored to that individual patient and making sure that the concepts of ALARA are centered in the mind while one is doing those protocols ends up being a very important part of how it is we're going to manage radiation radiation exposure to our population and, importantly, to our individual patients. And that really is going to become more and more part of our job that uh, we're going to need to pay attention to. 
You know, that donut, uh, to, to, to most of us, looks pretty soft and smooth, but to a child, to an older person, to someone who has diminished functionalities of any kind, uh, I put a couple pictures here of some very scary donuts um, that I found, but, uh, you know, the donut uh, of a CT scan actually can be quite, quite scary to, to almost anybody who's going through an already scary experience of being in the hospital. And providing a friendly environment or taking the time, and that's the most important statement, taking the time to provide a friendly environment uh, really will help your CT quality significantly. Um, it'll help have the patient hold still. And even with our fast CT scans of today, we'll often decrease the necessity for repeat exams, repeat slices, and obviously, therefore, increased radiation dose exposure. And what I find to be true is some upfront personal care that is basically just talking to the patient for a few seconds prior to putting the patient on. It can be a, a significant time saver, as it turns out, and a significant dose saver, because if you can make the patient comfortable and if you can make the donut look a little more friendly to that patient with a couple of uh, jokes or, or just some personal attention, you can uh, obviously become more than a button pusher, and it's the opportunity to actually provide care to your patient and provide some uh, some protection to the possibility of overexposing that patient to radiation. Um, and uh, one of the things that I also find helpful is to basically try to put as much of the scanner info in prior to putting the patient on the machine because that period of time from when you lay the patient on the scanner to when you get the scanner set up is often a period of time that really, really enhances the anxiety. And I will tell you that that is particularly true in the younger and the pediatric population where you can't talk to them as easy and they're not listening as well as perhaps an adult might in the same type of setting. Single phase imaging is the dosiest number. Um, it is, it is, it, 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 it truly is. That is, if you can get by with one scan instead of delays, instead of uh, pre and post. Now, sometimes in medicine they're required. Sometimes they clearly help to answer a specific question. And as always, then we have to weigh um, risk and benefit. But if one can get away with doing a good scan once and doing it right once, this is important. Where this comes up all the time is in emergency rooms. And in emergency rooms, uh, they want things done well, they're very, very quickly, and uh, basically just say, look, I, I don't want to do the oral contrast, I don't want to do the IV, just get the patient in there, give me an answer. And we see emergency rooms doing a lot of these scanners when really the indication clearly calls for either IV contrast or oral contrast, and therefore what happens, the patient then goes back to the ER, an inadequate answer is obtained by the radiologist. He recommends a second CT scan with oral and IV contrast. The patient is then exposed a second time or the patient is um, admitted for observation and then the attending comes in the next day and basically wants to have the, the real scan done. And that real scan obviously does answer the question hopefully, but it can also obviously double the amount of radiation dose that that patient uh, receives when they could have just received one. So single phase imaging really is, is where we need to be shooting for when at all possible. And just like my for Lauren uh, Edsel, uh, innovation clearly wins the game here. Um, communication and innovation really uh, are very, very important for the way we're going to conquer Alara problems. Um, there have been a lot of attempts at innovation. This is from, a, from a, an article that back in 2002 that, again, a friend of mine, Don Frush, is involved with to some extent. But we're clearly looking at ways that we can take children, not treat them the same, look at their weight, look at their body build, and figure out ways both built into the scanner as well as built into some of these commercially available devices that allow us to selectively care for that particular patient and the size of that patient and the clinical indication of that patient to be sure that we are exposing that patient to exactly the right amount of radiation and that the protocols that we utilize for that patient are designed not to just be one size fit all, but are designed for that patient and for that patient's particular size and therefore decreasing the amount of radiation dose that we expose that patient to. There has been so much work done by a, a group of people that are, that really, they deserve lauding and uh, Marilyn Gosky from Cleveland and, and many others have been involved in what is essentially the Image Gently campaign. The Image Gently campaign, the Alliance for Radiation Safety and Pediatric Imaging has been gaining momentum and leading the way since 2001 when Tom Slovis uh, 
initiated some of the white paper things that went on in 2001. Um, the adult population is uh, now being served by uh, Dr. Amos with the Image Wisely campaign um, pattern much after the Image Gently campaign, but designed for adults. So there's a lot of focus in the radiology community um, led by the Pediatric Radiology Corps that is really trying to get information out to the public, trying to get information out to physicians that allow us to really develop forums and develop discussions and develop interdepartmental conversation between radiologists and technologists to be sure that we have radiation safety and we have radiation dosing at the top of our uh, minds right along with making sure that we're making the right diagnosis when we read the film. So I would urge everyone on this, um, on this uh, webinar to take time to go to the Image Gently website uh, or the Image Wisely website. Spend some time there. There's an awful lot of information that I think you'll find useful. There is parental information. They basically allow one to download a wallet size card or um, a notebook size card that allows a parent to actually track the amount of radiation and the exams the patient has done for those patients clearly that are having more than one study. And additionally, it provides an awful lot of professional information um, concerning different CT protocol guidelines that are kind of beyond the scope of, of, of a lecture like this. It discusses uh, some brochure information that can be handed out to help uh, decrease the anxiety of the patient and particularly of parents. And uh, it goes through a lot of things about the uh, nuclear medicine consensus guidelines that have just recently come out with respect to how we're going to dose uh, nuclear medicine studies in children and adolescents. And, and also certainly adults will be coming up with their own. And, um, and again, I think this, this particular website and these two particular websites are really very, very good um, tools to have and probably for anybody in this room should be somewhere near your favorites list for your websites. And they're updated constantly and, and again, a, a very, very nice, uh, nice place to look for information. I'll just go through a couple of other websites that have been brought to my attention and that I've, I've looked at, and uh, uh, basically the Health Physics Society, the physicists and the radiation physicists really have taken uh, a lot of these issues into their society and have produced a lot of good information for the public, students, and teachers about the effects of radiation on the public, and certainly radiation exposure in the radiology department is a component of that. And also the RPOP site, which is the Radiation Protection of Patients site, is a very good uh, site to both have you uh, go to and also the general public to go to because it, it attempts to utilize in a very plain language uh, system uh, information that is, that is really relevant to the care of patients in the radiation environment. And then, of course, there's the ACR radiation safety site. Um, ACR and, and RSNA are, are collaborating on various uh, patient education websites, uh, and one can uh, find those on radiologyinfo.org. The other set of people that you really need to talk to is whatever organization you have that services your CT scans and manufactures your CT scans and your other radiology equipment. There is a demand on them, and they have answered to the call in many circumstances where they understand how focused we are on being sure that Alara interests are maintained inside the equipment base. And so there are a lot of new programs, a lot of new updates, and you should have a discussion with whoever your vendor is to be sure that you are on, tr on target to getting this information and getting the benefits this information can provide for your particular uh, imaging department and your partic particular um, uh, equipment to armamentarium. And inside the department, as you know, the radiologists are taking more of a back role to being the radiation safety officer. I see this as is, is somewhat appropriate because what's happening is that we have physics partners in many of our hospitals now, and these are people that who have devoted their life to understanding the vagaries of uh, radiation exposure and um, they are becoming more and more tied to clinical tear, care. They clearly ought to be part of the clinical team, and they clearly ought to be also involved in very active discussions to be sure that everything that they know to um, improve radiation exposure on your particular equipment sets are being done, and I find them to be great sources of information for me, uh, quite frankly. And for those of you who, who like me, I, I am... Uh, I'm not even in a 12-step program. I am a devoted alcoholic. Um, and uh, 
for those alcoholics out there and even for those that aren't, uh, if you go and, and look under Radiology Dose, you will find an app that is called My Radiology. This app uh, on these screen saves that I did, are, it's a very impressive app in that it's built for patients um, and for physicians. Um, for patients, the question is, has your doctor ever ordered a head CT to further your investigation of headaches? Have you wondered how much radiation you're being exposed to during the procedure or wondered what a head CT looks like? And uh, for physicians, have your patients ever asked you how much radiation they are exposed to when you order head CT? Did you know that radiation dose of one chest CT is 350 times the radiation dose of a chest X-ray? They propose that you should use my radiology to have help track your x-rays, CTs, MRs, and many common examinations. And then if you dig deeper, basically every exam you can possibly think of from a modality standpoint, and it's also divided into head parts, and gives you the opportunity to log in your studies and to learn and to actually see what a CT would look like. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an app that is commercial and, and actually I think has been a relatively popular app and um, it worth, worth probably taking a look at as well for those of us in the uh, the field because I think it will not be long before someone is going to stick an iPhone in your face and say, but look what I found. And so it's probably a good idea for all of us who deal with the public, particularly with some of these popular devices, to be sure that we know that patients are exploring this. Um, and what that demands from us is that we're very educated about all of these things and it's very important that we try to get as much information as possible and uh, my guess is we're going to see more of these type of apps and these type of information uh, resources for the public to have as, uh, as, they, um, as, as we go through our careers. So I'm going to go through kind of a long summary and, and you know if, if, if you manage to sleep through the first part of this and we can get you awake now, this is probably what you need to know and hopefully we can um, you know, use some time to discuss some of this stuff. But just for CT, these are the summary points. Uh, CT remains a major diagnostic tool, no doubt. Performed for appropriate indications and with thought, good communication, and with proper technical factors, this modality remains absolutely spectacular. The benefit far outseeds the very small individual risk, according to my friend uh, Dr. Tom Slovis, and, um, and certainly Tom is someone who I would trust in this regard. Uh, children are more sensitive to radiation than adults by a factor of 10. Uh, that's significant. Girls, as it turns out, are marginally more, are more sensitive than boys. Again, another factor to weigh in as we think about doing CT scan or perhaps as we think about what are the benefits of doing an ultrasound first uh, prior to doing a CT scan. There is an excess cancer incidence in individuals who are exposed to radiation doses comparable to the dose seen with helical CT scans. The mortality excess is very, very small over the lives of these individuals. And I want to emphasize that, very small. It is far more a public health issue compared to an individual issue, but it is not zero. And that is the point. It is a, it is a risk, it is a small risk. It has to be weighed about what significant information we're going to get to the CT scan, and that is particularly true in the younger patients and particularly true in female compared to adults and compared to males, but it's true across the board. And, and this whole concept of dosing expression is still a question. I'm going to tell you that in the next five years, this is all going to really evolve. There's a lot of work, actually a lot of exciting work being done, but for right now, I find it very useful to talk and think of terms of BERT and background dose equivalent information Comparing CT scans to background information, I think, gives a patient uh, information that they didn't have. You know, I make sure they understand that they actually go above background dose when they go in an airplane significantly. Uh, people who live in Denver, for instance, the Mile High City, are exposed to more background dose equivalent uh, dose uh, information than people that live in Death Valley or, for me, that lives in Pittsburgh. So, again, background dose equivalent uh, I think the, the talk point there is that it allows people to understand that radiation is everywhere, it's with us all the time, and that it needs to be managed, it needs to be thought about, that there is not necessary uh, room for a panic situation, and that uh, the, C the CT functions as a very important thing, but needs to be done with some great care and thought and with good communication across physician lines and between the physicians and the technologists. Our goal is to reduce radiation dose but still maintain an acceptable image quality. Again, we want to try to get this to be diagnostic. We don't need it to be textbook quality. 
Um, there are some exams that don't really require that much radiation to get an acceptable image quality for that particular indication. We should try to do exam only for appropriate indications. We should do them well. We should do them once. Um, where appropriate, use published weight parameters, especially in children, to help monitor. Um, certainly, the vendors are coming up with some very creative ideas to be sure that uh, ALARA protocols are followed when imaging children. But we have to pay attention and not just trust machines. Um, it's important to pay attention to the indication, uh, much less maybe needed on a follow-up examination, for instance, looking for a, a renal stone or a ureter stone than on the initial study. We should move away from fixed MA protocols. Um, we should begin to think about modulating the MAS, auto MS, or MAS that are, that are, that are uh, fixed with pediatric and weight control protocols. And then this whole KVP dose reduction is something that is gaining a lot of attention and clearly I think has some legs. And it's, got, it's not going to be as dramatic a dose reduction as uh, modifying the MAs in our protocols, but it clearly every little bit helps and so we're going to be seeing more about that. And really, I think that all of us who are participating in healthcare must uh, participate in the education of our peers and participate in any and all active discussions. Uh, I really believe that radiologists have got to step up here and be the informed radiology consultant. I think that is true of department managers. I think that is true of technologists who are serious about their profession. We really have to be very informed about what we're doing, and we must be able uh, either in forms such as this or on a day-to-day -day basis that our jobs serve as areas of resource for our colleagues and for our patients, and that is going to be a very important uh, point going forward. Just a couple of uh, comments on particularly fluoro and angio. Um, fluoro and angio, uh, it's, it's very careful attention needs to be paid to the machine design, certainly the use of pulse fluoro. I go to a lot of departments and see old fluoro machines being utilized. Obviously, the pulse fluoro machines really have some significant advantages. So if you're choosing fluoro machines or upgrading your department, it's very important to do careful vendor evaluations, careful attention to detail with what they're doing in their machine designs to participate in the uh, ALAR initiative. Um, and it's just essentially mandatory that there is vendor participation in ALAR programs and really not only do we buy the equipment with that thought in mind, whenever you are negotiating your contracts for equipment, please be sure that there is extensive CME training on particular machines uh, that should be routine. Uh, Alara-centric measures, Alara-centric training, Alara-centric training for both physicians and for uh, technologists must be built into the contracts and must be part of the discussion. Additionally, it's important, again, to have the physics uh, supporters for your department to, to support and evaluate the fluoro and angio machines, to evaluate essentially ALARA exposure rates and ALARA exposure rates per image. These are important numbers to have. There should be careful monitoring of fluoroscopy times. There have been many, many studies to show that physicians are, are notorious for having a wide range of fluoroscopy times. They keep their foot on the pedal. They move the patient while the fluoroscopy machine is on. And basically, that machine should be on only whenever you are obtaining an image to answer a specific question. And that needs to be part of the training. And that needs to be part of the monitoring. And obviously, there needs to be careful monitoring of recorded images per radiologist. You know, uh, an upper GI study that has 170 pictures is probably not very useful from a LARA standpoint, um, and, and that needs to be closely monitored and uh, looked at inside the department. Um, it is very likely that the above information, dosage information, fluoroscopy times, um, these are all going to be information that's going to actually be mandated in the report in the near future, so I would uh, just be careful of that. I think it's probably good to be proactive about that at this time and be sure that we're doing things and developing good habits on our fluoro and angio equipment with respect to ALARA, both in the adult and pediatric populations. Just a few words about DR and CR. Kind of underplayed, not talked about as much. Um, they're only a chest x-ray, but CR and DR also carry the potential for harm. Unlike film screen, which we all were brought up with, the acquisition process is essentially separate from the dis display process, and, and therefore a lot of wide exposures can be done. We have to be very, very good about making sure that we don't allow exposure creep to come in. We have to be very uh, compulsive about being sure that everyone is trained on the DR. And I'll just say a, a quick word about MR. 
We seem to be seeing utilization of MR increasing both on the inpatient and the outpatient. We shouldn't be surprised at that because uh, imaging does provide benefit, but MR is one way to do things without actually exposing patients to radiation. And nuclear medicine I don't have time to go into, but I certainly would not mind being invited back to discuss nuclear medicine. Well, by now I'm kind of running out of time. Uh, one would say maybe I'm a blowhard, but uh, as you'll know, I, I believe that just because we're in digital, the digital age, I don't think we need to be faceless. I really hearken back to the days where radiologists sat around and talked about cases prior to doing the film, after doing the film, and this is very important, and I think that uh, we need to get back to a little more of this where we as colleagues sit around and basically make sure we're doing the right thing by patients in a very complex science, which we love and know as radiology. I think we have to have very, very large eyes whenever we're looking for these type of things. And I think that those large eyes have to be very focused on doing great radiology, taking care of great, uh, taking care of our patients very well, and doing it in a manner that is very safe for patients. I am uh, obviously kind of fading, more importantly, running out of time. Um, I would uh, urge you all, this is a picture taken in Las Vegas during a test of a nuclear explosion, probably not wise, but I would just say that uh, you should drive carefully, you should image carefully, um, certainly would like you to come back soon. I'm happy to answer uh, uh, any questions that you might have. I hope that uh, this generates some discussion. I hope it generates some discussion inside your department. And um, I wish you a very effervescent and elegant thank you. And uh, again, one more plug for my friends uh, who have developed the Image Gently campaign and um, a good resource. So um, that, that ends the presentation today. I appreciate everyone's attention. I hope that you glean some information that will be useful, and I hope this serves as a, uh, a starting off point for an active uh, exploration of Alara inside of your individual departments, and uh, I do appreciate the attention. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I know that we've gone past our time, it's, uh, but if we'd like to open up for questions, or do you want me just to say that if anyone would like to reach Dr. Backstrom, uh, just contact your on-site moderator, and we will contact the hospital association. We will make sure that that contact inf information gets out to you. Did you, you want to go for questions? It, it, just let anyone know if you have to leave, we can make a, a recording of this available, so you can actually fast forward to the end of the questions if that is the way you would like to go, Dr. Baxter. I have I, I have some time. If, if there are, if there are specific questions, I, I'd be happy to try to answer any. But uh, uh, certainly, you're going to provide them with my contact information. And uh, if anything specific comes up, um, I'm more than happy to uh, to answer questions. Okay. Just a quick que uh, thing that the Q and A pod is available at the left hand side of the screen. And Anissa, would you be so kind as to ask for questions? Absolutely. At this time, if you would like to ask a question. Please press star then the number one on your telephone keypad. Again, star then the number one on your telephone keypad. While we're waiting on that, let me just very quickly say uh, thank you, Dr. Baxter, for, for speaking for us to, to us today. And please complete any documentation forms you may have been provided and keep a copy for your records. Anissa, do we have anybody who's in Q&A? Not at this time. Okay. Well, I just know that everyone has very tight schedules. And again, thank you, Dr. Backstrom, and thank you all for participating today. And again, contact your on-site moderator, and we can get you contact information for Dr. Backstrom. He's at Foundation Radiology, so you can also contact him through there on, on the web. So that will end today's webinar. Thank, thank you. Thank you. This does conclude today's conference call. You may now disconnect. Presenters, please hold the